This is episode 51 of Standing Out. Standing Out is a remarkable interview style podcast with the intention to highlight women and men making outstanding contributions in their field. This podcast is generously sponsored by Think Global. Think Global is a business advisory firm working with women entrepreneurs around the globe to scale their businesses to the next level. Today, I'd like to welcome Jen McClendon. Jen is a North Carolina native and graduate of North Carolina A&T State University where she received her bachelor's in chemical engineering. Her career began in pharmaceutical in the pharmaceutical industry, initially in rotational development program. It was during that program that Jen discovered that she had a passion to help diverse suppliers. Once she completed her development program, she began working as a supplier diversity professional. Her passion for assisting diverse suppliers grow and develop is what led her to join the business development team at Slice Communications. In this role, Jen collaborates with minority and women-owned businesses to tell their stories to a larger audience. Jen loves to combine her engineering process skills with her fun-loving spirit to drive results and generate smiles amongst the people she works with. Jen's favorite hobby is laughing, and she enjoys it most, watching a good movie or enjoying great food and beer with friends. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. Thank you are just such you. a joy to be around, and I have to tell you, your laugh and your smile is truly contagious. Um, just Thank in the few months I've known you. <laughs> <laughs> That is true for all you listeners out there. Um, Jen, okay, so for the people who are listening, tell us what supplier diversity is because I know not everyone knows what that term is. Sure. So supplier diversity, and it's actually starting to turn into supplier inclusion, is all about including minority women, veteran, LGBT, disability-owned businesses, as well as small business into procurement processes. So in the past, a lot of big corporations weren't including all suppliers, and most of these diverse suppliers are disadvantaged based on various things. So supplier diversity helps close the gap, so to speak, between larger corporations and these smaller diverse firms. So for a corporation, and I think many, um, you know, many, most people in a hiring position aren't intentionally leaving out any groups of people. Will you like speak to that a little bit as far as what the process looks like and why there is that gap that needs addressed? Yeah, so I think a lot of it comes from resources. Okay. So I think everyone wants to include people, all right, people. Right. I don't think anyone thinks I'm going to exclude you person because you're different. <laughs> exactly. No, and that's my point of the question because I, I truly don't think anyone is intentionally creating this gap, right? Right, right exactly. But, but there is a gap, so. <laughs> exactly, um, and it's, it's hard to close it, but I think a lot of times with the larger non-diverse companies, they have more money, they have more resources, they are global, so they have more access to, to things to be able to support other large companies. But with smaller diverse firms, they're, the access to capital is not at the same capacity. Um, the number of employees is not the same. And so even though they provide a lot of innovation and a lot of just thinking out of the box mm -hmm. mindset, without the, the money behind it, big corporations view that as, oh, that's great that you think differently, but you can't support me, big company, because you don't have the resources that your much larger competitor has. Right. That makes sense. So, so how did you, I know we talked a little bit about it in your bio, but how did you find your passion on the supplier diversity side, particularly with your engineering background? Like, <laughs> that's not the most linear path in the world, right? <laughs> so how not at all. <laughs> so I was in a rotational program at Merck, and it was within the manufacturing division. So my first rotation was in procurement and I was supporting site services, but I would run into the supplier diversity manager in the restaurant all the time. And it, we would just say, hey, bye, in the bathroom. And so one day she was like, let's get lunch, because I only see you in the bathroom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is awkward. <laughs> like, it's a little odd. So we got lunch and she explained the whole supplier diversity thing. And as a woman, as a woman of color, yeah. it was something I thought was really interesting, because I always heard of diversity in terms of HR, but I never thought about diversity in your supply chain. 
So that conversation turned into supplier diversity becoming a part of my rotational objectives. Mm -hmm. So I produced an internal website for supplier diversity. I wrote the script for um, a supplier diversity video that was later recorded after I moved out of the rotation Mm -hmm. and a couple other things within the program. So I knew engineering, at least not in pharma, was my thing. Yeah. So, but I loved helping diverse suppliers. I really love the the spirit that comes from entrepreneurs in general, but it's something special about people who are disadvantaged and how they push through the barriers. Right. I really wanted to be a part of that change. So when the program ended, I expressed to the CPO that I wanted to move into supplier diversity. He made some phone calls. I had an interview. And next thing I knew, I was a full-time employee wow. in global supplier diversity. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Like that's, I, I love when um, like passion and interest collide like that. And that's what you get to do for, for your job. I, I think that's incredible. So at this point, would you say like most corporations have supplier diversity departments? Or is it just some? Most of them. Most so of them. I think out of like the Fortune 500, the vast majority have okay. a supplier diversity program in some form of fashion. Also, so anyone who is a supplier to the government is required to do business with small businesses. So they have to provide a goal for overall small business, all the small business categories, by dollar and by percentage of their U.S. bid. And every year they have to report against those goals. And usually the goals continue to increase every year. Of course, right? So depending upon the nature of the the corporation, it may be focused on small business, which includes women, veteran, service disabled veteran, um, disadvantaged businesses, or it could be a larger diverse supplier pool. Okay. I feel like so many business owners don't know that this exists. So, <laughs> so that is one great thing. So if, if you're a business that's doing business with the government, you have to have a certain um, program to meet those small business sort of goals. Exactly. Now that is awesome. Um, what about on the corporate side? Is there, other than like... I mean, obviously hiring diverse suppliers is like the right thing to do. You also get innovation out of it and there's a lot of great benefits. Are there um, like government or tax benefits to also hiring? Like, like what, why would a corporation want to really focus on supplier diversity? I guess is the better question. So I think it's a few things. I think it goes back to the innovation piece. Okay. Larger, larger companies are big ships and they can't move but so fast. Right. But smaller, diverse companies are more nimble. So they can move quickly in ways that large corporations can't. So it doesn't benefit one big ship to work with another big ship and they both move really slowly. Right, right. But if you bring it <laughs> That's an awesome analogy. <laughs> Two big ships out there just floating. Floating <laughs> around, going nowhere fast. <laughs> but if you can get a speedboat to yeah. make all these different moves really quickly uh, and really fast, it brings uh, benefit to the company. Right. There aren't, to my knowledge, there aren't necessarily tax benefits, but for those uh, suppliers to the government, it is a part of their contract. So if they are not working with small businesses and they are not making every effort to meet those goals Mm -hmm. and increase those goals, they could lose their government contracts. Got it. Got it. And in pharmaceutical, the government is usually these big pharma corporations is their largest customer as a government. So if you aren't meeting their expectations that puts your contracts on the line. That's really interesting. It's kind of, um, it's sort of the secret behind the scenes that most people don't know or even yeah. think about um, as the government being, you know, the pharmaceutical's largest client. Like that's really fascinating. So you, what I think is so interesting about you, so you spent some time with a large um, pharmaceutical company in supplier diversity, but you actually made a leap to work with um, an independent woman-owned marketing agency on the East Coast. Yes. And what I think is interesting in our, well, you, you tell everyone why. Why did you make that move? <laughs> so it was for a few reasons. Um, one, I, it was a very small team supporting a global organization and For me, the workload was just becoming too much. I value life, I value family, I value friends, and 
I really felt that I was spending a lot of my time working, okay. a lot of my time commuting to work. So mm-hmm. I got back 10 hours of my life just by, That's yeah, amazing. 10 hours a week. It's- it was crazy, crazy. And then I was traveling a lot as well. Yeah. So I'm not married. I don't have children, but I aspire to do that one day. Yeah. Yeah. And with my busy work schedule, it was just not an option. Right. Um, so that was one. And then I also felt in supplier diversity, uh, in my particular role at the level I was at, I was confined with how much help I could actually provide. Mm. I wasn't the director of the program, nor did I want to be because that came with a whole nother level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not my dream. I love that honesty. <laughs> <laughs> nor did I want to be. No, not at all. But I wanted to really help diverse suppliers at the ground level. Yeah. and. As a supplier diversity person, I wasn't writing contracts. Mm -hmm. I wasn't choosing which suppliers we were going to go with. I wasn't having those development conversations at a certain level just because I didn't know enough about any particular industry Mm -hmm. to really help them to grow and develop. Okay. And when Cass presented me with the opportunity to come to Slice and really help diverse suppliers tell their stories, that to me seemed like a perfect opportunity to really help because I've noticed, and we actually did a study in conjunction with Wharton Business School around women-owned businesses and their digital disconnect and how they don't show up online and how buyers are consistently going to Google to oh. find diverse suppliers or any supplier. Interesting. And their online presence doesn't match their in-person presence. So being able to help them and show them, hey, there's there's a gap here. Yeah. And being a trusted advisor because I was on the other side right. and I know what worked and I know what didn't work, really being able to help them at the ground level was um, something I wanted to do. Right. And then lastly, I want to become an entrepreneur myself and I had no experience with small business. How do you start a business? How do you grow it? How do you hire people? Yes, How do yes. you, all these things I never really considered. I came to Slice to also get that hands-on, first-hand experience around living in a small business. It is so interesting that um, the just the things, I think it goes back to your example of, a, you know, big ships, hard to move, slow moving, or a speedboat. And I think that is like the perfect example between corporate business and, um, it, and, and entrepreneurship. And with that speedboat, you feel the waves a whole lot harder. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I can I can attest to that, um, but it's sure a beautiful journey out there. <laughs> um, so as we wrap up, my last question for you is about um, about what's on your radar. So as someone who is you know knee deep in this supplier diversity, um, and and you have a lens from like a couple different angles. So someone who is really an expert in that space, like what is on your radar right now that you think we'll all be talking about in another you know year or two from now. I think we'll all be talking about how buyers, how they buy, how it's changing. As Mm -hmm. more millennials are stepping into buyer roles, as more millennials are starting businesses, we really have to rethink how we do business. And I think that'll be the same for entrepreneurs and corporations. We really have to have a mind shift around how we buy, how we sell, who are we selling to, and where do they go to find us. Mm -hmm. And we're releasing the study in March, at the end of March, to really show this is how buyers are buying and this is how WBEs are showing up. And there's a big disconnect between how people are buying versus how people are representing themselves. And so how do we close that gap to make sure that women-owned businesses are being found? Right. People are looking, but if, if you don't have the right search engine optimization, or you don't have any social media channels, then when people look for you, or if you don't mention that you're a woman-owned firm, because I know that's another thing that a lot of diverse entrepreneurs don't tout. Right. Because it's like, you you come to me for my service, not because I'm woman-owned or minority-owned. Right. But right. people are looking for those folks. So helping close that digital disconnect. So that's interesting. And I know I said last question, but that leads me to one more question. How are people buying? Like, 
like what is that process it, it's i think to many of us it sounds like some mystery sort of thing or like a, a database that we all call the black hole like <laughs> that like we need to know that so i think historically not i think i know historically yeah. there are a lot of different supplier diversity databases out there okay. and so one diverse supplier could register in the database where they're certified and then there could be some others and then each company has their own individual one and the right. government has one for small business and it's too it's many so databases. Much. Yeah, too many. So a lot of times corporate buyers now are Googling. Okay. Is that simple? You yeah. just Google, you find you it. It's right there. And it's right there. So there's a shift happening between those traditional databases being the first place that people search it's turning more into a validation place so okay. i found the supplier are they certified they are great okay. perfect um but people are even judging suppliers based on their website their oh, social wow. media channels mm -hmm. the whatever they have in the news or lack thereof yeah. before even reaching out to them to see if there's an opportunity wow so mm -hmm. making sure people are present online the same way that they're present in person that is, and I love, that is like the perfect line, making sure people are present online as they're present in person. And so many of us women business owners, we do have great personalities that come across amazingly in video and podcasts and yeah. things like that. And I think so many of us, um, we don't leverage that. So y your work is amazing. And thank you for doing the work you you're doing. Thank you. Of course. Thanks for being here, Jen.